little bit of introduction into uh, Anuradha's book. So some books, when you read them, they'll entertain you and engage you. Uh, but while you read it, you don't feel like you're living inside the story. You can, you're conscious about the fact that you are a reader and this is a story. And once the story ends, you know you have to return to your real life and your connection with the story ends there. And there are, uh, there is a, another kind of books. When you read them, you actually participate in the story. The separation between the reader and the story kind of diminishes and you leave inside the story. And those are the kind of books that are going to stay with you forever. So Anuradha's book, One Day, One Morning, belongs to the second category. It's a story set in a small village in Kerala. It's a story of uh, that seen through two pairs of sisters, children, as they navigate uh, one, the world of wonders, the world of curiosity, but unfortunately also a world of suffering, hypocrisy, double standard. So it's a, even though it's a story set in a small village in Kerala, it has a universal appeal. So it, this story can happen in anywhere in the world, in towns, cities, villages, anywhere. It's a story about our hypocrisy as a society. As a society, we boast that we are a community oriented, community friendly, a society that has a lot of family values. Still, we don't want to interfere or we don't want to engage with our neighbors' troubles. We often ignore their veils behind the closed doors and we stand and watch from the safe distance of our verandas. It's also a story of double standards. This is a story how men can easily be branded as nice, good, hardworking, where our women are never enough. They are never right. So as I said, it's a story about a lot of things. But uh, don't mistake this book for a dry uh, commentary on you know, society or dry commentary of social problems. It's a very engaging and fun book. So it's, as I said, it's uh, repeated from the point of view of two, uh, gir two girls, two, uh, two pairs of sisters. And it is, uh, as from a child's point of view, it's fun to read. And at the same time, it's visceral. It's poignant and for me, the thing that striked the most was it's so thrilling. The book will hook you and you will rush to its end. So it's, it's uh, kind of uh, wonderful that when uh, within the small, the confined uh, form of a novella, the book is just below 100 page, around 100 pages. So Anuradha's book, One Day, One Morning, manages to be all these within the very confined space and I, when I read the book first time, when I read the first paragraph, I knew that I'm going, I'm going to be connected this book forever. And I never expected that uh, I'll be like, I'll be hosting this book launch, but that also happened. And I'm so honored and excited to present one day, one morning, and also it's author Anuradha. As all of you, I'm uh, very excited to learn from Anuradha what uh, the process of writing this book has been like and also about her uh, journey and process as a writer. So without much ado, let's uh, get into the discussion. Hi, Andrada. <laughs> Hello, Shalini. <laughs> Thank you so much, first of all. I think I think you've said everything. Um, that Did I spoil been... it? <laughs> no, 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 absolutely not. Um, uh, thank you, really, because it's not just not just uh, yeah. it's it's, it's working yeah it's not just a social sort of thank you it, it it really means a lot but before that good evening everyone uh, thanks to each one of you um, who's managed to make it here on a friday evening uh, i know it's not at all easy to make time for that for whatever reason for reasons of friendship everything else um, to make time to come to the space uh, where books are celebrated and i just loved the atagalata Ambience, uh, thank you so much um, for coming um, today. Uh, you've said everything <laughs> that had to be said about the book, but yes, it is something that um, 
was a bit of a, the book was born out of, I would say, not out of intent. Uh, I'm also not a very intentional writer. Uh, I, it, it even feels odd when I think of myself as a writer. Uh, identity is a very confused thing, I feel. But uh, this especially uh, is, a, is a product of, I think, many sort of writerly uh, coincidences. Uh, and it's a gift, I think, from the, the, the universe, the vibrations that I believe are there in the universe, which kind of pour words and stories and um, forms into the hands and hearts of some people. So that's how this came. But I'm just glad that it touched a chord with you. Uh, I'm also glad uh, that I've, I've actually heard similar sort of responses from uh, some of the people who've reached out after they've read this so far. And uh, it's actually a bit surprising and it's, it's amazing that words have that power. Uh, and the story or the narrative that, um, uh, you know, for me these characters, uh, every time I write the characters are actually very, very real, uh, real people. I mean, not in the real physical sense, but they exist. And I think it's, uh, it, I almost feel like I'm thanking you and everyone else on behalf of them uh, because th their story managed to connect with somebody. So that feels very special. So yeah, I have uh, prepared a few questions so that we have a form and uh, you know, structure for the discussion. So I think uh, you partially answered my first question, but I'll ask it anyway. So um, like, so when did you first think about uh, this thread of uh, one day, one morning? So this, uh, has it always been brewing inside you or it came suddenly one day? <laughs> one day. Um, it's actually neither, I think. Um, I, I mainly dabble, I mainly write poetry, uh, according to me. Uh, that's my form of comfort and, and that's also my form of convenience because I work in, in spurts, I write in spurts when there is time and when something happens in the head and that comes out as poetry and like I said, I'm, I'm not an intentional writer still. So that's my usual format and I and prose always feels daunting to me because prose feels like, a, you know, that's something that requires a more structured approach, you know, you need to have a plot, you need to plan it out, you need to have a beginning and an end and, uh, and all. Uh, and it needs to have material in between, you know, enough to fill up a few hundred pages, perhaps. So I usually stay away from prose. Um, once in a while, I just write down some lines, paragraphs, etc., that come to me. But one day, one morning is basically, <clears throat> uh, especially in a way, it started with the title, because it actually once came to me that. You know, that's the way we all sort of, uh, stories came to us when we were growing up. That's how people told us stories. And it, to a great extent, even today, that's how people connect over incidents and events, right? When somebody tells you something, one day this happened, you know, once this happened. So that's the, the most sort of non-authentic or inauthentic uh, beginning to any story. You know, one day, one morning, one somewhere this happened. So that sort of fascinated me. Then... Um, there were these kind of threads floating around in the head, uh, which was basically revolving around the fact that um, one, you know, a, a, a seemingly shocking incident could happen somewhere. And that becomes the focus of, let's say, you know, that feels very dramatic. But people walk away from that dramatic incident once that's happened, believing that that is the story. Like that's something very you know, that impresses you. But the, the, the story uh, is actually what happens to people to whom that incident happened or, or, you know, what happened afterwards, what happened before that, what led to that. And a seemingly um, random incident, it, it, let's say like a bus, you know, an accident, uh, you know, a bus hitting a car or something like that. Something unusual, something extraordinary, uh, visually, etc. could happen. And that feels very dramatic. That gets, especially these days with the way the media covers, you know, sensationalism around it. And especially if it happens in a small town or a small village kind of ecosystem where people talk and stories, um, you know, spread. There's speculation, there's myth making and all that. But really, that's not the story. It's really the before and the after. So that idea uh, 
took hold of me and then from nowhere these um, these characters manifested like for me it's 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 it uh, for me these characters appear in the way you know sometimes when you've switched off the lights in your room at night shadows appear on the walls and then those shadow characters start to speak to you so then these initially there were two sisters <laughs> and then after some time another pair of sisters appeared uh, and and i first wrote um, one part of it and then through various kind of forces pushing and prodding at me i built it up and then at some point i needed to walk away from this uh, narrative so I, it felt like nothing more could be uh, said so I, i needed to walk away so it just sort of materialized yeah so the <clears throat> i think the two sis two pairs of sisters are kind of the heart and soul of the story and we see the entire story through their point of view or their narrative so uh, when i was uh, reading this i i was there are two pairs of sisters so that is the one thing that struck me there are not two sisters there are like two pairs of sisters and i was always trying to compare them some them I, i was trying to see oh how same similar they are or how diff different they are so sometimes they feel like mirrors of each other and sometimes i feel i'm filtering other person's life through this character so uh, when you when you conceptualize these two pairs of sisters um, did you have anything in mind did you did you expect them to engage with the reader in any way like any any expectations no um, no expectations i didn't even expect readers at that point <laughs> so that's there but uh, i'm fascinated by the idea of um, in a way um, twinning uh, symmetry mm -hmm. uh, and the asymmetry in symmetry like you know if you look at the human body for example most of our critical organs have uh, you know are in pairs or there are like symmetries but even in that symmetry there are slight is asymmetry so when you have two kidneys you know both kidneys are almost the same size but one is a little smaller etc so so uh, that's there even in the physical form and uh, when it comes to characters i i they actually most of the time characters uh, manifest to me in in halves like two halves mm -hmm. sort of a thing so you know uh, even 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 in visual art when i i don't i don't um, paint or anything i love art which actually uh, uses mirroring uh, uh, and and the idea of two halves kind of being um, or, or requiring two halves to kind of make a whole and even that i don't believe is the whole so that idea fascinates me and the idea of sisters is is really uh, you know the, i mean women especially i think uh, in a way use the word sisters in a different way right when you when you are kind of sharing an experience when you are so that that term is used so all of this i think unconsciously play the part but uh, in in ultimately the the story uh, came out like this you know from the voice largely of one of them but there are two of them and it's it's really kind of them sharing this existence because just to tell the story from the point of view of of one lone girl felt insufficient so it had to happen to a pair of them and then it felt like there had to be another pair on the other side to contrast but also to constitute that ecosystem yeah i think i agree because um, if you are told it from only one one sister's point of view you wouldn't have got that contrast or how others are viewing them so it's like you know their own internal uh, like how they view themselves or their situations versus how somebody else from outside view so i think it was also a um, like for as a prose writer i felt it's a very good technique to bring out the entirety like the as a bring out the entire picture for the reader so i've always fascinated where um, this uh, novellas or novels been repeated from two different characters which is very interesting because the same event somebody see or somebody experience would be like repeated totally differently from somebody else's perspective so so shall i go to the next question yeah, please yeah, this so is a, this is a very um, question i wanted to ask from the beginning when i read the book so this this uh, story is narrated from uh, a child point of view not one child two children so uh, for me as a writer it's very difficult to write a story from a child's point of view because my adult mind always comes and you know nags me so how was it for you like how was the experience of writing a story from a child's perspective have you ever written or no 
Um, maybe I don't have an adult mind. <laughs> I don't know. But, um, you know, it's, it's really not about... So I have... I am a very uh, unschooled writer. No techniques. Uh, I don't have probably either the benefit or, or the sort of disadvantage perhaps of having uh, gone to... I mean, or being schooled in any way. So it's most of it is just organic and it's... All of it is organic and instinct. But... Um, I also come from uh, having, you know, like I come from Kerala. So in, in my upbringing and, and the kind of cultural milieu that I've seen, there is this, uh, there are many art forms where you, uh, the, the person who's performing literally becomes that person. There are different terms for that. And that exists in many kind of art forms, right? You become that person. Like that person takes over you. And there is a sort of um, separation that eventually becomes almost difficult to achieve when you're done with that performance. That also fascinates me. That, and, and sometimes these are masked theater forms and all, but ultimately there is a character who enters your head and speaks. And that is there, I think, in many art forms, like let's say music, for example, if uh, uh, you know somebody's singing, then they're actually singing um, either in the voice of the composer who composed that piece of music uh, or voicing out something on behalf of maybe another you know actor dancer etc so the um, transition or the um, maybe i don't know maybe trans migration into another person's being i feel is not that difficult so that's there but in this case i think for me when i write essentially those characters are talking to me i mean they're, they're telling me and they're dictating the things. The yes, words. I, I, I could feel that because uh, yeah, one of one one narrator, one sister, I felt she's a bit uh, like serious and you know a little bit uptight. But whereas the other one, she is like you know, I I can she kind of reminded me of many many of my friends. So she kind of reminded me of my childhood. So in Kerala, how I spent it, what I did, and you know all that fun things. So I think it has come out like really believable that yeah you you don't feel like okay Anuradha as a writer is speaking so the what I mean to say that the um, author's voice has never uh, seeped in because the it was always the characters always the girls and you know, like you're not for even a moment you will think about Anuradha so I think that's a <laughs> that's that's at least for writers it's a great thing when somebody totally. says I never I never person, I so. didn't even think about Anuradha when I was reading the book I was only thinking about the girls so yeah and uh, so the next question is about the setting so as I mentioned in the uh, introduction the setting is as interesting as the characters so uh, I am from Kerala and uh, I could really relate to all the things you say for example the smell of wild jasmine, the jackfruit halwa, the ada, and all the smell, sight, and especially men loitering around the tea shop, smoking beady and doing nothing. So, uh, so when we spoke, you you told me that you have never lived in that kind of a village setup in Kerala. So, even though you have lived, so how was what, what, like what? How did you get? How did you manage to get it so authentic and right? I don't know. <laughs> I think my answer to many of these questions is going to be, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so it's definitely not based on having, um, uh, you know, directly lived in um, um, those sort of milieus. But uh, I think, I think she was also asking me this. Uh, maybe it is just observation. Uh, especially, I think, as you, you know, like you travel through the state and you just watch. Um, picking up on what people tell you about themselves. Like, uh, you know, I have a, a, for example, I have a domestic help who lives in my house and she comes from there and she describes her sort of background. So that's just an example, but I, I generally collect, I think, um, I mean, I observe and I collect. Uh, wherever I am, that's something I, I know I do by sheer habit. Every little thing about people, about, um, and these things have stayed, I think, in the head. Uh, I'm sure some of these are also stolen. Um, <laughs> uh, and, you know, like uh, other people's lived experiences you can kind of take on. But basically it's from listening and um, picking up from mm -hmm. indirect observations, not not really directly having, um, no. Yeah, I, I, 
kind of relate to that because when you write about a place you not necessarily be there or have like you know experience but you have heard about it or you yeah. know people have talked and you have observed so observation is i think all writers keenly observe things. i i actually worry that uh, uh, it doesn't it may not seem authentic you know to people because i have i, I don't want any kind of my you know my urban um, experiences language uh, voice etc to seep into this so i was actually so when you say this i'm i'm actually again relieved because um, it's one thing uh, to to write it for yourself and not expose it but the minute you put it out then mm -hmm. people will judge it right so the lack of authenticity especially uh, or uh, especially about the physical milieu and, and these aspects is something i, I actually worry about because i i don't and I, I it's not that i go and then you know do some research and uh, make sure that it's i I'm, i'm lazy about that also so i just stick to what i've written and hope that those characters know what they're talking about ultimately yeah i think some of the things you have written like you cannot research and figure out or is it right or wrong because it's all very very uh, you know very native to a certain place for us i come from a very small village in kerala so i can uh, like you know i can confidently say that you got it right for sure <laughs> so um, again another thing which i really like the book the novel is its ending so when i when i write when people read the works and most of the readers like closed endings so they want the writer to tie up everything nicely give them give tell the reader what happens at the end and you know that's done and dusted so but your novel is open ended and uh, there is a lot of possibility for the readers to assume imagine and it could go any way actually depending on the reader's imagination the story could go any way so when you uh, wrote so you said you know you you felt that you have to stop here and so um like how did you how did you decided to have that open ending or how how did you f uh, figure out that yeah this is the ending so i mean i don't know whether you can answer that but yeah not the ending it, for me it was a point uh, from at which stage i wanted to walk away and and leave them alone you know it was like a journey so these people these characters had walked with me or i had they had allowed me to walk with them allowed me the privilege of looking into their lives you know go behind their closed doors and look inside their heads listen to them listen to and and ultimately a, a story is one person's version of something and that something we never know so uh, i was allowed to listen to some, you know a few versions of of those incidents and the narrative and at that point it felt like i needed to i should grant them that kind of respect or acknowledgement by walking away because if i stayed along it felt intr 